Hello, and welcome into this AAS, AAIS Pulse session on tracking cats and taming risk. I'm Phil Legrome. I'm the uh, Vice President of Data and Actuarial Solutions here at AAS. And for the next uh, hour, we're going to be talking a lot about hurricanes. I'm going to go first and frame the discussion about hurricanes through something we've built uh, and released back in early August called the Risk Awareness Service. So I'll be talking a little bit about what we built for this initial offering of this um, service. And then we're going to bring in Jeff Waters from Risk Management Solutions, commonly known as RMS, uh, to, to give us the um, cat, cat modeling view of how the hurricane season of, of 2020 uh, is going so far um, and give us some perspective on what he's seen. But I'll start with a little bit more on the risk awareness service and, and specifically what we have been, been building. Um, so risk awareness service is intended to provide information about risks that are included in our AAA, AAIS model programs. And we're really attacking it from two different perspectives. The first is an educational perspective, a background on the different, different risks. And then the second is a live event monitoring perspective on the, the risk as well. So there's kind of a, a one-two punch to understand the risk itself and then what's happening with it uh, currently. Um, Hurricane, we started building um, for this initial release of risk awareness service back in uh, July of, of 2019, um, not knowing how big of a year, of course, it was, was going to be in 2020 for hurricane. And, and as I'm sure all of you are aware, it's, it's shaping up to be a huge year uh, in, in a bad way for, for, for the industry, especially with everything else that's all um, happening at the exact same time. But as we've been building this out, there's a, there's a few major questions that we wanted our, our members and the regulatory community to, to get out of this service. One is some background on, on the risk itself. You know, what is, what is happening here from a science perspective, from a history perspective, um, getting a handle on the risk, just, just overall understanding of it, and then segue into how has the insurance industry responded to that uh, risk over time to better contain the volatility of it through various uh, ways of, of, of addressing the risk and how has that evolved? Um, so that's, that's one piece. The next is what about our model programs? How do they contend? How do they manage that risk? How are we addressing it? So as AAIS, as an advisory services firm. So that's the second piece. The third is the monitor what's happening now. How, how's it evolving at present in, in a near real time uh, scenario of, of what's going on. So hurricanes of 2020, what, what's going on with those um, right now. And then specifically and more specifically, what does that mean to me? Getting some tools out there available to our members and the regulatory community to assess what, is, what does this mean to me? What, what's the proximity of these risks to me and how do they relate to me? So that's been our, our focus. And, and I will stress that this is the initial risk hurricane that we're releasing, but there's many more to come. I'll give you um, some insight into one we've already built out, at least partly built out for risk awareness service as well, which is COVID-19. So that'll that'll be something I'll I'll be um, hitting on as well. So with that said, first of all, I'm going to be uh, sharing my screen now. I'm going to be showing you uh, where we are with respect to uh, the risk awareness service for Hurricane. Now, I think it, it's good news right now. It's a quiet time for tropical cyclones in the Atlantic Basin. That, that's great news. It's not so great for a demo, but it's great news, I think, for the industry that we it is quiet right now. But I did want to show where what it looked like just um, 
just a couple of weeks ago. I'm hoping this is all showing on, on your screens there. So September 14th, this is what the Atlantic Basin, this is what our risk awareness service, what we call the Alive Event Tracker looked like. So as you can see, we've got a hurricane about to make landfall. That was Sally, a category two hurricane right on the border between Florida and Alabama and the Pensacola area that, that was making landfall while there was actually four other storms active. And you can see where they all rolled off the west coast of, um, of Africa. This was all going on just 15 days ago. Just 15 days ago. So very active just a little while ago. Um, we don't see that right now. So I'm gonna go back and show you, uh, give you some more background into risk awareness service. And you're gonna be seeing that live event uh, tracking uh, map again. But first I wanna start off with how you get into this service. From AAS Online, you can see we have a new link here, risk awareness service. And then when you drop into this particular screen, you'll see we've got our first risk uh, that we're addressing listed here. And then there's two paths. You can go to the left, that's the education side I've been, I talked about before as one of the fundamental uh, pillars of what we built for risk awareness service. And then the left is that real time monitoring of what's happening with risk awareness service. Um, so, Let's start off with going into the educational piece. And when you land here on, on this side, what you're going to see is starting off with an overview of the particular risk, hurricane in this case. And then we start digging deeper into the fundamentals of it, the hazards involved, the lessons from the, the past. And we're getting more and more focused on how the insurance industry and AAIS are specifically direct um, addressing this risk as we get into deeper into uh, the insurance um, deductibles, hurricane deductibles, mitigation credits, the residual market, so on and so forth, down to some conclusions. And I will say that the beginning uh, of, of this particular um, uh, webpage, on the during the overview, we give an understanding of the current forecast for the season. And with this, this is Colorado State's version, and then we have the National Hurricane Center version. That will be updated every single year. So as we're getting coming into the hurricane season, you can you can get an understanding for what what are the experts that are focused on um, the meteorolo meteorology of of hurricanes expecting to happen. But as you move your way from left to right, you can get more and more and more information on how the industry and AAS are addressing uh, the risk. And the same will be uh, true of other types of risk that we incorporate into the risk awareness service uh, over time. This is really a master's class on hurricane risk as it um, as as it pertains to the insurance industry. That's really what we've built out on this educational aspect of the risk awareness service. Um, and there is a lot of depth within these pages as I quickly will scroll through. A lot of this is interactive. If you printed out all the information we've got in here, it would take up over 40 pages. And we have um, over, ex over 70 external links to other sources. So it's really a encyclopedic uh, understanding of hurricane risk um, can be um, obtained through going through this aspect, the educational aspect of our risk awareness service. So that's the first piece. And the other one that I, I gave you a little preview, at least a PowerPoint preview of, of, of the other one, which is the live event tracker. So that's the other path we, we could have chosen when we first landed on the risk awareness service. And, and as I alluded to before, we don't have all those live storms going on out in the Atlantic that we had a couple of weeks ago. You do see though, that there are some, some storms in the Pacific uh, going on and this, this tracker will show those as well. But um, 
in addition, there's a lot of other information that's included in the in this real-time monitoring or near real-time monitoring, a lot of different layers. I'm going to refresh this really quick just to kind of go back to the beginning of when you get into this page, what you're going to see. And the first thing that uh, comes up is what's called a um, splash screen that tells you how to use it um, and gives you some, some information about how to navigate around the legend, the layers, there's a measurement tool and some base maps that are included as well. So then once you click into that, what we have right now is a default view. Since we have no live storms in, in the Atlantic, we are showing, if I if I um, show the, the layer, layer list here, what we're showing is um, some historic five year, uh, the last five years of historic storms tracks from 2014 to 2018 are shown. And they're, they're also shown by their category. So they're color coded by their category. And if you click on a particular storm, you can get more information about that storm as well. Now, if there are live ones, then you would see a lot of additional information about the, the live storm, including uh, the, the, the cone, like we see over here, the wind speed um, predictions and such are all in there. And of course, the path and the categories are, are all in there as well. So what I've also um, would like to focus on is some layers that are curated layers by AIS we've included. The one that you see here right now is um, the industry exposure uh, values. Um, so those are for AAIS specific, scroll to the bottom, um, AAIS specific rating zones. So if I scroll, if I, if I zoom in here and click on a particular area, it'll show me it's the AS Louisiana rating zone. 12, and it'll give me uh, a variation in the total insured value uh, from lowest to highest in that in that area. And this is powered by um, our partner in, in this endeavor, RMS, in using their industry exposure database. And where we have we have um, pulled it down into the values in specific to that AAIS rating zone in this case it's re residential values so that in this way you can see both where the storm is and where it's heading in response or in recognition of where the values are so that that's the idea give you a better understanding of the risk from that perspective but that's not the only thing you could see you could also see from an aas curated perspective the the um the base loss cost that we we have as well in built into our program. So this way you can you can kind of get a flavor of both. You can get the exposure values and how we built the base loss cost for wind into our into our programs. We kind of get that one two perspective of uh, values and and base loss costs. And then we've got some other tools that are built in here. You, you saw that there's some layers that I that I had that I had. Um, shown here that are not clicked on. You can, you can play around with watches and warnings, tropical storm, or tropical storm force winds, and so on. A lot of different uh, live layers, active layers in here. There's a measuring tool also, so you can measure the distance, say, from a particular event to a notable area where you may have exposure or you're concerned about it, it striking what is the distance. Um, away. And then lastly, there's a lot of different base mats to choose. We, we anticipate these would be used if you wanted to print out um, a, a map showing the current status of, uh, of an event, for example, relative to exposure, relative to base loss costs, something like that. So that's, that's kind of how we've built this all together. So that's a quick tour. Um, please get into this service, start using it. Um, I, I should have said before, but I'll say now that if you have any questions about it, please click on the, the link here. It'll send those questions to me and some others on my team as well. Also, if you notice any technical issues, like a map not rendering, something like that, we've really not had any of those, any of those types of 
issues, but we want to know so we can fix it in any technical issues like that as soon as possible. Then there's another link that you can click here uh, to, to, so we can um, address that. So that's a run through the risk awareness service uh, within with the initial release, obviously focused on hurricane. We'd love to hear your thoughts about it as we move forward and, and start to add additional perils. And one that we uh, just actually released on September 18th, I wanted to touch on as well. And this is really uh, something that it, it's, it's piggybacking on some fantastic work that our legal group has done with regard to COVID-19 and putting together just a, a huge library of information with respect to what's happening out in the world um, with regard to regulatory issues. Um, and we thought this falls right into uh, the, the wheelhouse of the Risk Awareness Service, especially from the standpoint of this live monitoring. So what I thought I would do is just show you two different, well, I'm going to show you one dashboard, but make sure that you're aware there are two different dashboards we've released. The resource tracking one for tracking uh, COVID-19 related DOI bulletins, orders, as you, as you can see here. And then on a lit litigation tracking one as well, specifically focused on business interruption litigation in the U.S. resulting from COVID-19 uh, coverage disputes. So it's a way of serving up a live view of what's going on and that you can then interact with. So if I, if I go to the litigation dashboard, what you'll see is a paragraph at the beginning, just, just giving you some information about how to use this very interactive, interactive dashboard. Um, also, there's, there's more information about the dashboard down here, more about how, how to use it. But just looking at it from the top, you can see it gives you the number of um, total complaints related to business interruption and disposition. It means they've gotten to um, an, an endpoint. There's a map in the center showing you where these are all occurring. And that's this is once again an interactive map where you can actually click on the states of interest and the top industry sectors as well. And just to kind of give you um, some flavor of this, if I just click on accommodations and food services, the whole map gets filtered for that. So if you are really focused on accommodations and food services, you click on that, then you can see all the litigation related to that. You can actually click into the litigation, the cases them, themselves on this panel on, on the left. And if you did want to do a, a multiple selection, like of several different groups, you can see how many cases are specific to that. You can you can filter by uh, specific dates of interest, and you can also begin to dig deeper and focus more on specific combinations of occupancy states, court types, so on and so forth, and continue to, to drill down to see what's really mattering to you for, for your particular area of interest from a, from a, from a member carrier standpoint or from a regulatory standpoint as well. And if you need to clear everything, uh, just a quick user tip, just refresh and it'll refresh all of it. You'll start at, um, at, at square one with a com completely refreshed dashboard with all the cases uh, litigation. Uh, we built a little bit out on the, the monitoring for, for COVID, but we're gonna actually add in then for, for pandemic and education section. We're gonna move on uh, to wildfire, obviously, very busy wildfire season uh, as well. Unfortunately, a lot going on there. So that's that's going to be the the next uh, peril or risk we're going to be adding. But we want to hear from our members of where to go from there, and also how to refine this service even more. We think it's it's useful, uh, but we want to hear about how we can make it even more useful, even more of a useful tool to uh, to manage your risk. Um, going forward. So I'll pause there and now we're going to um, bring in Jeff Waters, my friend Jeff Waters, who um, is a senior product manager in the model management uh, group at Risk Management Solutions, RMS. Welcome in, Jeff. Great to see you today. 
Thanks, Bill. Thanks so much for having me today. Hope you're doing well. Um, so, um, by the way, I should have mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, there's a, there's a form just below the screen. You can post them there and I can address, we can address the questions in a Q&A session um, at the end. So, Jeff, I thought we'd all start off with a, a, a question. Um, as I went through the risk awareness service, um, there are things that that a modeling firm, a high quality modeling firm like RMS provides that are not in our risk awareness service. So I thought it would be a good idea to provide uh, our audience with some insights into what you can do, what your, your firm and, and other high quality um, cat modeling firms can do uh, to kind of complete that uh, equation on, especially for the, the hurricane season and the one we're in right now. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great place to start. Um, and I guess the, the first thing I'd say is, uh, you know, talking about the risk awareness service, it's it's an incredible uh, piece of software there to help help you know provide that that useful bit of awareness um, when a storm, when a tropical cyclone is is threatening to make landfall um, or ultimately has made landfall in in the Atlantic Basin. And and what RMS, what we do at RMS, I think will certainly complement um, a lot of of what types of use cases. Um, and what some of the objectives are of the AAIS you know, risk awareness service. So when we talk about RMS event response, uh, that is one facet, one part of, of our company at Risk Management Solutions. Um, we have a dedicated group of individuals that is dedicated to live risk assessment. We have 24-7 um, live event monitoring for um, natural catastrophes. They can be climate-based, they can be earthquake-based, um, and they can also be a variety of other forms. But uh, when we talk about hurricanes specifically, um, that is very much one of the biggest parts of our event response uh, service. And we've done this, you know, continuously over the last, say, 20 years or so. Um, it's not, and, and it starts with monitoring the evolution of these real-time events as they unfold in various basins, including the Atlantic. Um, it also involves you know, if we possibly can to help reconstruct um, the impacts of those events. So, so any client of ours, any user um, can can take those tools and not only understand, you know, where the storm is tracked, but also understand um, potential or incurred, you know, uh, losses potentially uh, from a hazard perspective or a or a damage perspective. Um, and then we also stress very heavily the the value of of putting boots on the ground. You know, putting our reconnaissance teams, our our engineering experts there on the ground following an event um, to survey the damage because every data point counts, every data point matters in terms of understanding the overall scale and the breadth of the, the impact of these events. So so anybody who's using our products can understand that um, as, as effectively as possible. Now, uh, putting boots on the ground is a little bit more challenging uh, this season given COVID, uh, but we have come up with some, some useful alternatives uh, to, to help us, you know, validate and verify the, the extent and the severity of those, those damages. So uh, a couple visuals to help support some of our, our event response teams and kind of what we do. Uh, we have a, a forecasting center down in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, where we have a, a dedicated team to follow tropical cyclones around the clock. Uh, we put together some useful graphics like you see in the top right and the bottom left uh, to help understand, in this case, the bottom left was Hurricane Laura. The top right was more like a, a comparison of various wind fields um, during, you know, for storms during this season and compared to previous seasons. But what we try to do is give you as much context as possible, um, again, to help complement um, a lot of the other useful analytics that are coming through the risk awareness service that, that Phil's gone through. And then Oftentimes, we have opportunities to to uh, communicate these types of um, facts, these types of insights, well beyond RMS um, throughout the industry. In this case, this is my colleague Tom Tabatelli. I'm speaking about Hurricane Laura on, I think, the one of the news networks there in the in the UK. Uh, it's okay, Phil, to spend just a couple more minutes talking about sure. the various types of of products that we produce. Um, this. 
this summary, this, this slide kind of summarizes that um, because start to finish for a, a very impactful tropical cyclone, it, what we produce takes various forms, um, starting with um, comprehensive summaries or qualitative summaries of, of what's going on with the events um, leading up to and following landfall, what's actually happened. And then on the top right, we often provide um, what we call accumulation information to help kind of understand, help people understand uh, how much exposure do you have in harm's way, potentially? Um, how much exposure is at risk uh, to this event? And then at the bottom left, we, we also put together quite a few loss modeling um, analytics to help, again, understand that the, the breadth, um, the overall magnitude of those impacts to your book or maybe the industry. And then oftentimes, especially for the most impactful events like we've seen this season, um, putting this all together to summarize the events start to finish in a, uh, in a different kinds of RMS special reports. So uh, quite a bit to talk about, quite a bit uh, that we use to and produce to help um, our clients as best as possible. Um, here's some, some graphics to help put some of those, those things uh, together to give you a better idea of what, what we're talking about from an accumulation standpoint here. This is Hurricane Dorian last year where we kind of put out the, the likelihood of the different parts of the U.S. coastline to be impacted by damaging winds. And then from a loss perspective, we'll oftentimes create a subset or identify a subset of stochastic events that best represent the, the current storm that's unfolding. So you can get an idea, a range of possible losses. And then the most, I think, comprehensive or sophisticated uh, product um, that we produce is the, uh, the collection of footprints after the event where we collate all the different uh, pieces of hazard and vulnerability information to produce as closely as we can um, a reconstruction of the events, you know, one to two weeks after. So no shortage of, of tools. Um, and that even takes us to some of our newer products, and that is what we call RMS H-Wind, which, which complements the products I just walked through because we're, we're seeing just how impactful, we know already how, how impactful tropical cyclones can be in the Atlantic. After going, you know, more than a decade without a major hurricane making landfall in the U.S., we've seen quite a bit of a regression back to the mean um, these last couple of years of uh, very impactful storms. And that's prompted us to do a lot more um, in the tropical cyclone space. And that starts with H-Wind, where um, this suite of products is designed to, to give you a little bit more information leading up to landfall about potential track, hazard, loss. And then even in the middle here, getting a bit more of a detailed look at the wind field as the events unfolding, and then try to put together as, as quickly as we can um, the, the, the wind hazard or the trailing part of the footprint um, as it's unfolding. Because we know if you're a primary, um, if you're you know, any, kind of, any kind of company out here that has to make time critical decisions, um, time is of the essence. So we're, we're really doubling down on, on that ability to, to give useful to give analytics that can help someone derive, you know, actionable insights as, as fast as possible. So I know that was quite a whistle stop tour of all the different things that we can we can do and we can we produce to help complement, you know, the risk awareness service. But hopefully that's all right. Well, that was great. And I kind of look at it as um, the risk awareness service. If you, if you kind of think of it as a, a relay race, we we're focusing on kind of the front end of education and and monitoring um, events in, in our world and then we hand a baton to, to someone like like rms to, to grab it and giving more detail and more quantification really of what's going on from different types of of perspectives um that kind of take it that 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 last mile and awesome um awesome suite of of products that you guys have available there so my next question is 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 from a cat modeler's perspective for this this season, this hurricane season of 2020. What is your perspective of of what's going on, where we are? Just some some observations on that from from your perspective would be great. Yeah, that I think that's such a a very topical question, and it's just kind of like where where do you begin? You know, when when you <laughs> have to look back and comment on on the season so far. I know you had a couple of um, very useful comments early on in, in your in your part of uh, of today's segment. Uh, 
I don't know if my screen is still showing, but yeah, I, I was able to boil down some of the, the key themes and takeaways, I think, from a, a cat modeling perspective um, that I'd love to talk about. I think the, the first thing that we have noticed is that it's not one single hurricane event that is to blame or that is to that has really driven the, the focus of this season. It's also it's a combination of, of hurricane events. We've seen numerous um, hurricane landfalls already from Isais to, to Laura to Sally. And each one of those events had its own its own unique um, drivers of damage. So that's the other part of this number one here is that it's not just one component of what drives hurricane losses that has been the story. Uh, so we've had some storms that have been wind driven damages, but other storms that have been more water and storm surge driven damages, like more, most recently with um, with Hurricane Sally. So it's it's quite a bit to to monitor already, but it's not just about one storm or or one one event so far. Uh, and that kind of brings us to number two here. It, we think it's more than just the total number of storms that have occurred. I mean, it's no doubt from a total number of storms perspective, 2020 could rival what we saw in 2005 as far as you know, maybe even breaking the record for a number of storms in a season, given where we are right now. But you know, from a cat modeling perspective, it's it's one thing to monitor the number of storms that form. It's another thing to track or to monitor where they track and where they where they track relative to exposures at risk. That's what we care most about is is monitoring those the the impacts, the damages that are driven by these events. Um, and and when you take a look at it from that perspective, um, and I have a couple of, of slides later on to talk about that. Um, I think in a lot of ways things things could have been a whole lot worse so far. Um, yeah. I'd say, dare I say we've been you know, a little fortunate in the, in the market uh, to not have seen the the major, major, you know, loss driving events like we've seen in recent seasons um, so far this season. We were just talking the other day, Phil, about um, Hurricane Laura and how it kind of threaded the needle between um, two yeah. major metro areas in New Orleans and Houston. And you just wonder what, how much different things could have been had it shifted 100 miles in either direction. So, um, for those who are listening, you know, that's the kind of thing that we always monitor from a cat modeling perspective. Um, and that kind of brings us to number three. This season, the past few seasons have also underscored the importance of having an efficient uh, event response process in place leading up to and following landfall. So if you're a, someone who's listening today, you, know, you, you very likely have, have some kind of uh, you know, effective event response process in place, but Given how many storms we've seen, given how many name storms that have made landfall, I think nine already to date, it's it just underscores the the importance of having that process as finely tuned as you can. And uh, I think the tools like the Risk Awareness Service and and some of the other you know vendor based tools that are out there uh, are designed to help facilitate and support that as as effectively as possible. Um, the last couple things here, I'd say, Phil, are you know the from a cat model, again, from a cat modeling perspective, the, the importance of being able to quantify all sources of loss when we're talking about an event. You know, so many le leading up to this season, I think you've seen an evolution in, in the cat modeling tools that are out there in the market, um, starting with the ability to model the wind and storm surge impacts. But now we're starting to see more tools out there that can quantify the inland flood component of risk. Um, and also going the extra mile to talk about different PL, different uh, components of post-event loss amplification, non-modeled sources of loss, all those things can contribute to getting an idea of the full loss number. And that's what we, we've really invested in and, and prioritized, um, you know, being able to do here at RMS there for the last couple of years. Um, and then the last couple of things too, I'd say are, you know, if you're someone who's, who's constantly monitoring all the different numbers that are coming out, uh, in the market industry loss perspectives, uh, whether it's from RMS or a different model vendor, it this season, the number of storms that we've put out industry loss estimates for, um, it highlights the importance of understanding what's behind the number in a cap model. A lot of, not, not, not only from an uncertainty perspective, but going back to all the different um, types of assumptions that go into um, a model number. If you're someone who's reading and comparing loss estimates, it's, it's really important to know how those estimates were derived, 
what they include, what they don't include. That way, if you if you need to make any um, apples to apples comparisons, it, that that's a way to to do so without finding yourself making an apples to oranges comparison. Um, and the last thing I'd say, and this is more just a constant reminder for us, you know, we we know that uh, at the end of the day, cat models are our tools. You know, we we're helping do whatever we can to help the the industry understand uh, potential you know frequency and severity of losses and also real time um, drivers of loss. But ever it's they're they're not they're not perfect and they nor do we try to you know pitch them as something that are perfect. So. Uh, every event for us is a learning opportunity to help improve the models or understand where they're working well and where there's opportunity for improvement. And that's something that uh, this season and previous seasons have definitely given us uh, a lot of data points to do. That's great. Uh, so the next question I had for you is sort of alluded to some of these already, but I just wanted uh, wondered if there are any interesting takeaways for insurers as as a result of what we have seen so far with this yeah season yep and I think I think one of the biggest um, unique elements of of this season has to do with you know the the impact understanding the impacts of covid um, covid 19 yeah. covid the pandemic however we want to refer to it. Um, that has been a major, major um, topic of interest, and I love seeing that element of of the risk awareness service having a COVID you know component because um, unfortunately you know we don't know how how much longer uh, those types of things are going to persist. So the best we can do is kind of understand um, the the impacts they're having today or potential right. potential impacts they could have um, in the near future. So uh, what we've monitored as closely as we can is understanding how. COVID could impact the overall loss picture, um, you know, from an event, from a claims perspective. So the biggest part of, a, of, the, of the loss equation that we, we have noticed and we think COVID could really come into play is the post-event loss amplification. So that's when you talk about the unique circumstances of an event that are going to drive um, the increase in the overall like average claim cost. All right. And you know, a couple of examples are are things that we've highlighted in all the events that have made landfall this year. Um, first and foremost, you know, there unfortunately might be uh, fewer people to actually conduct loss inspections following real time events, and that might prolong the repair and the recovery timelines, both of which could increase overall claims costs. Um, we we've also seen high levels of unemployment um, in certain sectors, um, that which could lead to what what we've seen in the state of Florida specifically is uh, maybe an uptick in the assignment of benefits ordeal, which could also drive increases um, in the overall cost of a claim and, and loss adjustment expenses. Now, I have a follow-up point on AOB in just a second, um, so I'll come back to it, but I'm kind of rounding out these points here you know, on the BI side, which is what I loved in the uh, risk awareness service application is having that, that tool to see where the BI impacts have really come through. Um, this is just one flavor of that where in, in the event of a business that's been severely impacted by an event, there might be less incentive for that business to reopen quickly, um, in which case it could, it could exacerbate um, or increase the cost of, of the BI claim that's being filed um, if they take their time or don't, don't want to seek to reopen as quickly as you want, as you would normally expect them to. Um, so. You know, I, I love that that you know in these times there there's a tool out there to help kind of track that in real time the way that you you've put it together, um, your your team has put it together I should say, um, and the one other thing I'd say too and this is something I didn't get a chance to put on the slide but uh, just in the past few storms we've seen so many um, land falling hurricanes that that can have a downstream impact on on the supply cost it's not so much COVID related but increasing the supply cost, increasing the the cost of things like lumber. You know, this in the last several months, the price of lumber has skyrocketed to record levels. Um, some of that's driven potentially by COVID, some of that's driven by uh, the events that have taken place. So we are monitoring all different, all the different spokes, all the different different types of direct and indirect impacts of 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 COVID this year. And hopefully that that summarizes a a couple. 
and if it's okay, Phil, I was going to just add a couple other bits on AOB. Um, I, I, I know that there's a lot of you know, primaries that are listening in, some of which may be in the state of Florida where AOB is most prevalent. But you know, the assignment of benefits issue where the policyholder allows a third party to seek you know, direct payment from an insurance company on behalf of the insured. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen the, the cost of AOB just skyrocket again over the last uh, few years. But we also know that there's some very helpful legislation that was passed, I think, last year to help curb potentially the impacts of AOB. Um, whether or not that's going to come through and, and we're going to see a, a more muted impact of AOB, um, it, it, that kind of remains to be seen. But we'd like to think that there'll be fewer, less, less impacts, smaller impacts from AOB going forward. We have not seen a major landfalling hurricane in Florida this season, other than the impacts of of Sally and, and Pensacola. Uh, but we'll have to see how that unfolds. Um, and then also in Florida, keeping an eye on what we call you know law and ordinance, where there's a couple different elements of law and ordinance and whether or not it's going to come through. Um, when we speak about law and ordinance, we look at a couple things like the the damage to the roof because um, there's as part of law and ordinance, if a roof has sustained more than 25% damage in the last 12 months, uh, it's, it, it's, there's now a mandate to make sure that roof gets replaced in its entirety. Yeah. That could increase the, you know, the, the payment there for that home or that, that structure. And then the other part of it is for a lot of these older buildings that have been damaged, there's an additional cost to bring those homes or structures up to the current building code, which could also, um, you know, increase the the overall cost of what's being paid out. So a lot of these things, a lot of these things are tailored towards the Florida market right now, uh, specifically. Thankfully, we haven't seen a huge impactful event there in Florida and time will tell if that's gonna remain the case for the rest of the season. But hopefully those were um, some things that I wanted to note on the, you know, for any insurer who's, who's kind of listening today. And on that uh, particular note, uh, we've we've got um, two months left in the uh, maybe more in the uh, the hurricane season. So, what are your thoughts about uh, the the road ahead over the next few months for this this season? Yeah, that that's a question that that we have a number of folks keeping a very close eye on um, at at RMS. And I think I was just checking today. We we just put a couple of blog articles out there um, just recently. So if you want to learn more, by all means, take a look. Uh, but it's okay. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides uh, just to get to that, just to that, get to that point. Um, so I think the first thing to note, and this is something that I think many of us have, have noticed over the last several weeks, is that those organizations out there like NOAA or Colorado State, some of the more reputable ones, that that do update their seasonal forecasts at the midway point of the season or you know in the august time frame we have seen those forecasts yield um significant increases in the forecast number of named storms for the remainder well i guess overall for the season but especially for the remainder of the season as you can see in these couple of tables i put together you know noaa increased their initial forecast of 13 to 19 named storms up to 19 to 25 which is getting into, you know, doubling the, the climatological, you know, long-term average, which is astounding. And mm -hmm. with that, you know, increasing the total number of hurricanes and major hurricanes that have been forecast, I think, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, you know, wh where we're at right now, I think we're in the 20s, you know, somewhere in the 22, 23 range for number of named storms. So it's, it's just incredible. Um, but when you look at how many of those storms have reached major hurricane status uh, or even hurricane status, you know, just a subset of those so far. Uh, however, you know, the, there's still plenty of time left in the season. And Colorado State, similar deal. They, they've released a few more updates to their seasonal forecast since April. And as you can see, in all categories here, their forecasts have trended upwards. Um, and it's just incredible to see how where these forecasts are and how many of them are, are verifying, you know, given that we've had 20, 23 named storms. So uh, while we're in a bit of a lull this, this week for many of us in the industry to catch their breath, 
Uh, I'd say that looking ahead over this, the next seven to 10 days, I reading all the different you know, blogs and all the different articles that are out there by the ex by other experts. I think it's more likely that you know we're going to see another another spurt of of active you know an active part of the season, mostly because um, of two main factors. I think the first is what we call La Nina. Um, that's a you know a phase of of Enso where the the parts of the Pacific Ocean are are cooling um, much more than average, or yeah, cooling much more than average. And you talk about the impacts it has in the Atlantic; it actually creates more favorable conditions for for tropical cyclones to develop and form um, by reducing the amount of wind shear that's out there in the basin. So, the latest forecasts that that have been put out by some of the the experts in this space at Columbia University have suggested a very high probability of La Nina conditions um, persisting through September, October, November, which is the remainder of, of hurricane season. And that's that's one part of the puzzle here towards towards keeping those conditions favorable uh, for for TC formation. Um, and the stronger that La Nina phase is, um, the more favorable those conditions are. And when we talk about a stronger Anything below, in this graph to the right, anything below the negative 0 0.5 number is considered a, you know, moderate uh, phase of La Nina. And as you can see, a lot of the forecasts over the next, you know, three months here, I've indicated a a La Nina phase that's below that 0 0.5, that negative 0 0.5 degree uh, mark. So but we'll have to keep an eye on that over the coming um, coming weeks. And the other part of this puzzle, oh, I should say. Bill, uh, why do we care so much about the ENSO phase? In addition to talking about how how it creates favorable conditions for tropical cyclone formation, you know, RMS has done some studies on historical events in the damages that they've they've caused and when these events have occurred relative to ENSO phase. Um, and as you can see in the blues here, any that, that denotes like a neutral or a strong uh, La Nina phase. As you can see, looking at some of the work we've done, uh, when there are storms that form in that phase, it can tend to drive um, higher losses overall on average. And uh, that's why we care so much about this right. and, and why it's worth paying attention to over the coming weeks. Um, the last part of this I'd say is a common thing we all, we all have heard is sea surface temperatures. Both of these types of plots just show that anything in yellow on the left denotes warmer than average sea surface temperatures. We're seeing that currently it's going to per persist through the remainder of the season. And the other image here on the right kind of shows the, the depth, we call it ocean heat content, so the depth of that warm water. Mm -hmm. That also plays a role in the, the amount of energy that's available for storms to form. And we see a lot of it right there in the, um, I guess, parts of the Gulf of Mexico and Western Caribbean. So keep an eye on that uh, over the coming coming months, and then even over the next seven to ten days, we'll see see how things unfold. Right. So keep our seatbelts fastened for the <laughs> next couple of months as we ride this one out. Um, yeah. Okay, that's great information. So I've been monitoring the questions I've come, that have come in. There's two. There's uh, two, two that we have time for, at least one for me and one for you. The, the one for me uh, is specific to uh, now that we've built this risk awareness service. Um, how can we as as members of AAS uh, get involved and, and influence basically how we build it out going forward? I, I did show a, a screenshot uh, when I did the demo. There's a little link at the bottom. We are, uh, you can click on that. That will send an email out to us, to a selected group, including myself. If you wanna be involved, we are putting together an, an advisory group um, for that service to, to help guide us to, to build it out and, and refine it. This is just the initial releases I've, I've said a couple of times already. So that's how you can start the process of, of getting involved. Um, and we'd, we'd love your feedback. We want to build this uh, as cater this to member needs as, as, as 
much as we possibly can. Uh, and then the, the other question we got is related to uh, the non-controversial issue of climate change. Um, to what extent could climate change be playing a role in the very active hurricane season we are seeing? Uh, Jeff, no pressure, but what do you think about that question? Yeah, that's, oh my gosh, if I had to make a list of the most commonly asked questions, that, 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 is, definitely, that is definitely one of them. Uh, I think just in general, um, over the last few years, we have seen climate change become, it, I mean, it's always been um, a fairly popular topic. Um, it's some one of those questions that's been asked to us uh, very frequently, especially over the last few years, and it's it's prompted us at RMS to um, you know be be investing more in helping our our clients understand you know the impacts of climate change, whether that's forward looking or even understanding the impacts of climate change to date, um, as we know there there has been some. Now it's not our position to comment too too much on the you know the the drivers of climate change. It's just to, to help to comment on, on exactly to what extent it could be contributing um, to events like this this season. And I'd say right now, based on the research we've done, uh, there's a variety of theories out there, um, and and some of those theories are are really being supported by by the events that that have taken place. So there's there's theories out there where uh, we have that are stating that storms that are forming and tracking towards land will undergo, are much more likely to undergo rapid intensification before mm -hmm. they make landfall. We saw that in 2018 with Hurricane Michael. We saw that already this season with Hurricane Laura and even to an extent, uh, Hurricane Sally. You know, all, the, all three of those storms have rapidly intensified and that's it's always been one of the, mm, one of the weaker elements of forecasting models to help forecast rapid intensification. So like, to the extent that that can be harnessed and, and built upon, um, not just in the current climate, but even going forward, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that we're really keeping a close eye on. Uh, the other couple of theories that are out there are, are the, the forward movement, how fast storms move. And there's theories that suggest that in the future, you know, maybe even already coming through since 2017 with storms like Harvey, that storms that are about ready to make landfall might be more likely to stall and right. slow down and pump enormous amounts of moisture, enormous amounts of rain in, right. into those, those, those areas. We saw it with Harvey. Uh, we've seen that a little bit maybe with Florence, but this year with Hurricane Sally, I mean, I think that storm was moving upwards of like two to three miles per hour yeah. when it made landfall. So it's these types of theories that many of the scientists out there are, are talking about and, and suggesting, you know, there are, the storms of this season and even recent seasons are are serving to be very useful data points to help verify, I think, and to help validate some of those some of those theories. So, us at RMS keeping a really close eye on it, and and we know that this topic will continue to get um, interest, and we'll just make sure we do our best to be ready to comment on it and even offer some tools to help quantify. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, we're we are out of time here, but a lot of great information um, from you um, and the, what, you, what you guys, you, great work you guys are doing at RMS. Obviously, we got a couple more months left, um, and it's great to understand all the tools that are out there that we can provide and, and that you can provide as well, better manage the risk and, and make our way through this, this very tricky uh, storm season in, in 2020. So I'll be signing off now, but join us at the top of the hour um, as we get into the weeds for a closer look at trends and legislation uh, related to cannabis insurance. And this is not to be missed. But thanks, everyone, for your time and attention today and have a great rest of the day. Take care.